Hi, it's Heather from Thick It Works, and I have been away for a couple of weeks developing this special SVG bundle that will allow you to create two variations of medieval doors in one twelfth scale. So a couple of weeks ago, I got the idea that I wanted to create a set of medieval doorways that we could use in our one twelfth scale miniatures of course, using the Cricut Maker. The subsequent weeks have been devoted to working out all of the design challenges inherent. Now, one of the strong points of this design is that it can work with any depth of wall that you need it to. This example is sandwiched around a piece of Fomilar insulation board, which is an excellent and strong building material for miniatures. You can also create the same effect on a thinner or even a deeper wall structure. Because these two plates that act as the door surround are individual components, they can be placed on either side of any depth of wall. And that won't affect the way that the entire set works together. There's an integrated latching system and hinging system and this example of course has the grating in the center of the door but this is only one of the variations available the grating is really cool and i'm very proud of how that's worked out here is the latching system and it's very simple but very effective we'll be using some basic materials like lightweight chipboard and cardstock in addition to things like regular wooden toothpicks and wooden matches, plus, of course, a whole lot of glue. Now, I'd like to sort of go over the history of this project with you before we get into the details of the build. It'll give you a little more insight into how the iteration and prototyping process works. Let's take a look at the first iteration of this idea. And here we have it. Um, many of the basic elements are here. The working latch is already in place and all of that functionality is just fine. There are, however, some things about this that disappointed me. And that's why I decided to delay release of this bundle because I wanted to make sure that it was the best that I could make it before unleashing it on you guys. Okay, so one of the first things that I'm not terribly happy with is although the latch works really, really well, I had not yet figured out the best way to create hinging that worked as well, nor had I discovered the method that I'll show you for creating what looked to me like realistic nail heads. At this point, I was simply coloring in all of those cutouts and had used regular metal hinges on the back of the piece. And frankly, I just was not satisfied with the result, although it was perfectly functional. Now let's take a look at the second prototype. Now, by this time, I had worked out a way to create nail heads that really made me happy. There is actual texture here, and each of the tiny nail heads has a slightly raised surface, which to my mind is so important for the ultimate feel of authenticity in this build. And it's a subtle but important contrast with the original prototype. That subtle but raised texture is a vast improvement over the original. It catches the light in, as I say, a very subtle way, but it makes a big difference. Additionally, there is a threshold at the bottom of this design that was not part of the original design, and I think that that helps as well. But the big holdup was not the latching, which works well, as you can see, but the hinging mechanism. Now, I came up with a way of creating these integrated hinges 
using matchsticks and toothpicks. You may or may not decide to use that same system, but I felt that it worked out quite well for me. And the files will support your use of that method if that's something you choose to do. Additionally, we have the sort of over door decorative panels that are affixed to either side of the surround. And here you can see that this door is embedded into a double thickness of regular foam core board, which also is an excellent material for building miniatures with. In this particular iteration, one side of the build is slightly recessed, creating an interesting shadow, and the other side is flush. But both sides have that raised texture for the nail heads. The original prototype was only the depth of the door itself, and personally, I didn't find that as satisfying. Now, before we even get started, I want to make it clear that I personally found not only the designing of this bundle to be a challenge, but also the build process itself. Not that I'm an expert, but I'm going to rate this as an advanced miniaturist project. And the reason for that is not because we do anything super complex, it's that the precision required in order to make certain that the latching mechanism and the hinges work correctly can be a bit of a challenge. So if you're up for a challenge and you would like to incorporate these items into your builds, then let's take a look at how the entire process has come together. My first job is to work on the hinging mechanism. And for this, I'm using a very fine drill bit to create a small hole in the end of a wooden matchstick. That hole is just large enough to accept the pointed end of a regular toothpick or cocktail stick. Now, once these have been joined together, it's important to glue them. And for that process, I'll be using Starbond Thin Super Glue. This is my adhesive of choice for anything requiring super glue these days, and I just love it. Um, what's made it even more easy to work with for me is the acquisition of the little needle tipped bottle that you see me working with. It makes really precision application possible. So once these two pieces have been glued together, I smooth them out with an emery board. And then I clip off the end of the toothpick and shorten the length of the toothpick using a craft blade and then shorten the end of the matchstick. Now we'll be trimming these again later on, but this is the preliminary size. With that out of the way, I'm ready to begin actually building the door. And the basis of the door are these four layers of lightweight chipboard. On top of that, we'll go these long panels, four for each side of the door. And on top of those panels are these pierced panels. Again, four for each side of the door. Around the exterior, we have this inner frame that has apertures that accept the hinge pins that we've just created and that also provide a slot for the latch mechanism. We have additional inner frame pieces that have only the cutouts for the hinge side but are smooth on the side where the latch mechanism is housed. That will enclose that area. Two of these will go on the top and two of them on the bottom. Additionally, you can cut as many of these 
plain surrounds as you like. Or you can skip right to using the ornamental surround, which is layered like this. The door is constructed by laminating together all four of the inner panels. I recommend using a solvent-based adhesive. I like Yuhu, and I also like Fabri-Tac. Fabri-Tac is a really versatile glue, and it will not harm your foam core or foamular panels, so it's a good idea to have some on hand. Yuhu, on the other hand, does tend to have an adverse reaction with foam products, so I use it exclusively for joining together pieces of chipboard. For more delicate pieces, I really like Zig two-way adhesive. Once that inner panel has been laminated together, I begin constructing the double layer of these long planks. One plain plank in the back, and then the pierced piece on top. Do your best to line up all of the edges here. Using a brayer helps eliminate any chance of warping. I recommend that you add the side pieces first once it's time to begin constructing them. That way you can get the spacing just right. I like to begin with the panel that covers the area that houses the latch and then I switch to the opposite side. Once those two pieces are in place, I then do my best to center the remaining two planks. Again, using a brayer at every stage. Once the first side is complete, flip the piece over and repeat the process on the reverse side. Now you have a door that is eight layers of chipboard thick. It's a good idea at this stage to do any necessary sanding to neaten up the edges before we harden the chipboard. It's much easier to remove material while the chipboard is in its raw state. In fact, I was able to get rid of any striations along the edges just using an emery board. Now it's time to begin hardening the entire piece using super glue. I really like this precision applicator bottle. It eliminates the need for much of the smoothing out that I'm so used to doing. I only reach for my plastic gift card when there's a little bit of pooling on the surface that needs to be smoothed out. The goal here is to apply as much super glue as necessary so that the chipboard has absorbed a decent layer. You'll notice that even though this is doing a great job of hardening the upper surface, those indentations are not being captured by this process. So I will be going back and detailing all of those little cutouts Make sure to harden the edges of all the exposed chipboard. I go ahead and harden the large surface areas of both sides of the door before worrying about going back and adding super glue into all the little cutouts. It's necessary that super glue penetrates the entire surface in order to avoid warping later on. If we were to skip adding super glue in all areas, as we add water-based media at a later stage in the process, this could cause the chipboard fibers to swell and perhaps even our laminated pieces to want to come apart and we certainly don't want that. Impregnating the chipboard with super glue gives us moisture resistance in addition to providing hardening. 
So even though it seems a bit tedious, it's important to make sure that super glue penetrates all of these little holes. The hardening process typically results in a slightly rough texture. So take a few moments and smooth out your piece using sandpaper. I'm using 180 grit here. The hundreds of tiny little square cutouts of chipboard are going to come in handy now. I'm mixing up a black wash using isopropyl alcohol and a dropper full of black India ink. Now I've chosen to use this rather than a water-based stain to accomplish two goals. The first is that I don't want to build up a lot of sticky pigment on the surface of the chipboard and I also want this to dry quickly. The alcohol will evaporate very quickly and I speed the process up with a heat tool. If you choose to do that, do so at your own risk. Alcohol and heat are not typically the best of friends. Now all of these dried black squares are going to become our faux iron nail heads. I experimented with several different methods for achieving this look and this is by far my favorite. And yes, it's tedious. There's no denying it. But to me, the final effect is worth it. Using a needle tool to pick up each individual square and press it into place was the most efficient method that I found for creating this look. Experiment with your own ideas. You may come up with something much more efficient and just as pleasing to the eye. Once I've added all of these little mosaic squares on one side, I go back and verify that they're all pressed firmly into place with the butt end of my needle tool. And then I apply super glue over the entire surface, solidifying it and making certain that each of the nail heads stays in place. Now that the basic door has been put together, I'm going to concentrate on creating the latch mechanism. This involves laminating together four of these pieces right here. This is the tongue of the latch. And the aperture that is cut out of one end is sized precisely to fit a wooden matchstick. Once the piece has been laminated, harden it with super glue. Before hardening the edges, I go ahead and smooth them out with an emery board. The hardening process tends to make the material swell a very small amount and we need it to slide smoothly within this little channel that we've created. There. That works perfectly. Okay, so here's a regular matchstick. I press it into that aperture and verify that the tongue of the latch is moving smoothly. Latch is designed to be operated from either side by piercing all the way through with a single matchstick like this. But for now, let's set this aside and turn our attention to creating the door jam. This consists of four laminated layers each of which have the cutout on one side for the latch tongue and the double cutouts on the other side that will hold our hinge pins. Again, I'm using a solvent-based adhesive and a brayer between each operation just to verify that everything is adhering quite successfully. Once all four layers have been successfully laminated together, the edges of the piece inside and out are hardened with super glue. And then super glue is applied to the flat planes and smoothed out when necessary 
using a plastic gift card. This can result in some rough edges. In my case, I decided to smooth them out using this nail drill with a sanding drum. Now we can begin to see how everything is going to function. And at this stage, it's time to begin building the components for the decorative door surrounds. There are three layers here in graduated sizes. The largest goes on the bottom layer, followed by the mid-sized, and finally by the narrowest. Just do your best to line up that last piece by eye, aligning the lower edge of all three panels. You'll want to create two of these panels for each door. Now I'm going to trim down the hinge pins that we created at the very beginning of the process. And I'll smooth them out and add additional adhesive. This is a process of trial and error sneaking up on the correct dimensions by snipping off a little at a time, smoothing out the ends and sliding the matchstick into place until the vertical portion, which is made by the toothpick, lines up with the inner edge of the door frame. We'll be trimming down these toothpicks a little later in the process. The matchstick that works as the handle for the latch mechanism has been trimmed down in size so that about a quarter of an inch protrudes on either side of the mechanism once it pierces all the way through the tongue. This piece of wood is being dyed with the same dark wash created using alcohol and ink. And this is to avoid any swelling of the fibers that would occur if I used a water-based paint. I just want to tone down the raw wood appearance, and that does the trick. Okay, now it's time for the really fun stuff. There are 16 of these little sort of leaf shapes, eight for each side of the door handle. And then a whole bunch of other shapes for the hinges, the latch plate, and the decorative overlays. These are applied to the upper portion of the decorative panels that go on either side of the wall. A pair of very fine tipped tweezers really helps to get everything aligned. A gentle touch here while you pull everything into place is a good idea. And then you can make certain that they are permanently glued together by pressing firmly with a brayer. You'll want two of these decorative overlays for each door assembly. The hinge assemblies are created with one piece that has the tongue that extends sandwiched between two of the shorter decorative pieces. Like this. On top of that, there are four of these plates that can be added to create a real sense of depth. Make sure to add all four layers on only one side. We need the underside 
to remain flat. Okay, now I'm gluing together eight of these little shapes for the door handle. I can't possibly use a brayer on something this small, so I just press them firmly together with the back end of my tweezers. You'll need two of these plates for the latch mechanism for each door that you construct. Each plate is created using two layers. Once all these pieces have been laminated together, harden the latch plates and the door handles with super glue. Don't apply super glue to the tongues of the hinges, however. You'll want to bend this tongue toward the side that doesn't have the stack of plates on it. And then I used the tip of a needle tool to create an initial bend in the very tip of this tongue. Because my quilling tool does not have a long enough aperture to reach all the way across this wide strip of paper, I approach it very carefully, one side at a time. I begin the curling process, then I turn the piece over, and from the opposite side, I repeat that same curve. Now, once that's complete, I can go back and roll a tube out of the entire length of this piece of cardstock. I apply quite a bit of opposing pressure so that the tube that I'm rolling ends up being very, very tight. I go slowly, applying finger pressure at every stage, and finally pressing it together quite firmly for a few moments before extracting the quilling tool and replacing it with a toothpick. We need this cylinder to be precisely the width of a toothpick. So that's why we're unrolling it around the toothpick, now applying adhesive and rolling it back up so that it fits very snugly. Then remove the toothpick and immediately harden with super glue. If you wait too long, the curled paper may begin to unfurl and you'll have to begin the process over again. So I like to harden it as soon as I've withdrawn the toothpick. I add as much super glue as the paper will absorb. These pieces need to be very strong. Now I'm going to apply these decorative plates over the slot that houses the latch mechanism. It's important to line this piece up correctly so that the mechanism can slide smoothly. Here I'm nudging it into place so that the cardstock doesn't overhang that slot at any point. Now I'll turn the piece over and repeat the process on the other side, removing any excess adhesive. And verifying that the mechanism is still free. Now I'm pressing the end of the dyed length of matchstick into the hole in the handle and then affixing it with Popper's Bondo. I 
I used a little bit too much super glue here, resulting in an unsightly blob. But that's easily filed away using a sanding drum and a nail drill. There, nobody needs to know how messy I was. Okay, so now that the first handle has been affixed, we need to pierce through the hole in the tongue. Okay, that sounded really gross, but you know what I mean. Once you've pressed that through the hole, flip the piece over and slide the second door handle onto the other end of the matchstick. Carefully apply a tiny drop of super glue, and if you like, make it even stronger by using baking soda to cure it immediately. And then you can just file away the excess. This leaves a rock hard bond. I definitely think it's worth the extra trouble. After all, we want this door to function for decades to come. The placement of the hinges is crucial. And because it's crucial, you'll find that the tiny cutouts on the hinges match up with the same pattern on the face of the door. So line those up to the very best of your ability. That's going to ensure that the hinges are going to function properly and match up with the hinge pins that we've worked so hard to create. I'm using Fabri-Tac here to glue these in place. It's an excellent adhesive for heavy items like this. And then I'm reinforcing the bond at the back with a little bit of super glue. A pair of decorative, non-functioning hinge shapes are then glued on the opposite side of the door, matching up with the hinges that are already in place. There we go. Now we're going to dry fit our door with the inner door panel that has all the fancy cutouts. The tongue of the latch should fit into the aperture on the side and the cylinders of the hinges should rest in the trenches on the opposite side. If you're going to be using this door frame, you may want to apply one of these blanks onto the exterior to disguise all of the cutouts. Now I'm retrieving our little hinge pins. We've already verified that they fit in place. So I'm going to insert them into each of the cylinders at the back of each hinge and then fit them into the pre-cut slots. They will press fit firmly. As long as you're using a matchstick. Now I'm going to glue everything in place. A little bit of super glue where the matchstick meets the chipboard. And a little bit of baking soda sprinkled on top to make it an extra strong bond. And of course, to cure the glue instantly. Now I'm adding adhesive on top of that door surround. 
and adding an additional layer of two sections that have been laminated together, each of which have the hinge cut out, but not the cutout for the latch mechanism. That additional room created by the hinge cutouts is crucial for this to work properly. You can now either add another blank on top or leave it as is if you're going to be covering it up with the decorative outer panels. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm layering together two layers of foam core board. And then adding the decorative door surrounds on either side of this assembly. Now the door is permanently caught between all of these layers. At this point, use whatever techniques you would like to add character and age to your piece. I used a combination of black wash and coffee stain to create a subtle but striking weathered finish. I'm quite fond of the way that the chipboard looks once it's been hardened with super glue. But adding touches of weathering is always the most satisfying part of this kind of project. Yep, I like the way that looks. Now it's time to place the decorative overlays. Two separate designs are included. I chose to use one of each design on either side of my doors. So here is our completed plain medieval door assembly. This one is embedded in two layers of standard foam core board. It's flush on this side and slightly recessed on the other. That was a lot of fun. Now let's work on the other variation of this door. And here we are. It's precisely the same as the door you've just watched me build. With the exception of these frame pieces, the cutout in the center of the door, and these funny pieces that look like tic-tac-toe. We'll be creating faux iron grates out of these. The door assembly is constructed in precisely the same way as the previous version. The only thing that's different is that we add two layers of these frames on either side. Once the frames are in place, line up the grating against the holes in the face of each frame. Doing this will give you a guide that will allow you to press a blade into the edge against these little pieces of chipboard, creating a scoring line precisely where you need it to be. Once you've created those scores, reinforce them by gently bending the piece with your fingers. And once you've created this sort of basket effect, immediately harden it with super glue. I chose to harden the inside of this little basket shape 
first. Holding it against the work surface to maintain the correct angle and then flipping it over and hardening the outer surface. At this point, once it's cured, you'll want to trim the ends so that the grating is the distance from the frame that you would like it to protrude. I trimmed mine down about oh, a quarter of an inch. And then I added baking soda into each of the cutouts in the face of the frame, used my tweezers to make certain that the ends of the grating were inside each of those holes, and then added tiny drops of super glue using a precision applicator. The baking soda causes this to cure instantly and creates a rock hard bond. At this stage, I was so overexcited that I completely forgot to pre-paint the grating, but I recommend that you do. It's a lot easier than attempting to paint it afterward. And here I'm going through the process of adding each of the individual nail heads. making sure each one is glued firmly in place and hardening the entire exterior of the piece with super glue. It was only now that I realized I needed to paint the grating and it took some brush gymnastics to get all of the little nooks and crannies covered, but I managed in the end. Don't be like me. Paint yours ahead of time. And don't forget to paint the inner edge of the window aperture as well. Adding a bit of weathering to the surface. And here's a trick to help center the latch handle so that it doesn't slide back and forth between the sides. You can trim a tiny piece of a cocktail straw like this one. This makes a little cylinder that you can then slide over the matchstick and it will create a spacer that will hold that side of the assembly at a predetermined distance from the plate. Then, once you push it through, you can add an additional tiny snippet of a cocktail straw on the other side. And this will hold the handle in an equidistant fashion. It's a little finicky, but it really does the job well. These pieces slide right over the matchstick, no problem at all. And then just apply the opposing handle on the other side. Glue it in place, taking care not to allow any super glue to trickle into the mechanism. We certainly don't want that frozen in place. I just added a drop at the end and smoothed it out with an old card. There, everything's still working freely. Excellent. Now, this particular door, I chose to embed into a thicker piece of foam. I glued and clamped the exterior panels in place. and verified that everything was working correctly. I gotta say, this is my favorite. I have 
absolutely love the look of the faux iron grating. And even though it's only one layer of thin chipboard, it's incredibly strong once you've hardened it. This piece taught me so much and I'm so grateful to have had an opportunity to share it with you.